Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Well, let me just say this is a very important day for um, Baltimore. I want you all to know that we are really moving swiftly to implement the provisions of our consent decree. As I said a couple of weeks ago, we have had no intentions of delaying or abandoning this mission. And um, as you can well see, uh, we know that it's important to reform our police department. And Judge Bader obviously did agree with us. He signed the consent decree, as you well know, on April the 7th. Today we are announcing the launch of a website which is dedicated to Baltimore's consent decree. This website is live, it's live right now, and will allow the public and interested parties the ability to follow the process from start to finish. This is going to be a transparent and open process because we need the community's input to make true reforms to our police department and to build a stronger relationship between the community and the department. The great thing about this is that we all agree that this is the right thing to do. And you all know that when we walked into this office, uh, we put a lot of energy, time, and commitment to making sure that we got the consent decree done. And today I announced the application process to fill the five positions on the Community Oversight Task Force. It is on our website. It is really important that citizens of Baltimore have input to recommend reforms as it relates to the civilian oversight. Some of the task force responsibilities will include reviewing the functions of the Civilian Review Board and whether the ability of the community to seek accountability for police misconduct is hindered in any way by the Baltimore Police Department civilian complaint process. Determining whether changes should be made to the Baltimore Police Department's community policing strategies to increase cooperation between the Baltimore Police Department and the communities it serves. Examining whether the community has sufficient access to information about the Civilian Review Board's process and organization, complaints, investigation, activities, and discipline recommendations process to promote public confidence. For members of the public who want to complete the list of the task force responsibility, you can get that, and you can apply or nominate someone who you believe should be on this task force. All applications, all applications are to be submitted no later, underlined, score, double, in bold, May the 23rd this year, 2017. We're moving forward. And finally, I want, I'm really excited that we are about to begin the process of request for application for the independent monitor. The independent monitor is really important to this process because this is a person or group that will oversee uh, this whole process. They are the linchpin to the consent decree and the entire oversight process. We expect the application process for the independent monitor to be robust with applications coming from across the country. We've already had folks inquire as to when this process would begin from as far as uh, New York and some folks in LA and others who've been involved in this kind of process. Uh, we want to make sure that we get the best applicant uh, to do this work. Applicants can go now to the city city by website, which is really operated by our purchasing department and visit the site set up by the federal judge where they can also review the RFA as well. I am again excited that we are doing this and that we've maintained our commitment to this process and we look forward to the citizens of Baltimore applying uh, and we also look forward to reviewing uh, the RFA. So um, I don't know whether you want to add anything, uh, Commissioner, because um, I did May 22nd. May 22nd. Did I, if I said May 23rd, let me correct that. May 22nd. Jane, I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> May 22nd. May 22nd. May 22nd. Let's make sure we get that date out there. May 22nd, because I don't want anybody a day later saying she said, May 22nd, we, we need the community's input. We want them to apply. And this board is also going to be very important to us. And um, finally, I'm really excited. And I want us to, uh, I want Baltimore to know how serious this process has been for us. 
and uh, how grateful we are for the input of community members from across the city who've had their say in terms of what they believe we should be doing in terms of police community relationships. Um, I also want to add that this process, the consent decree, not only does it build, we believe, will build a better relationship between the police and the community, it would also allow us to get the tools that we believe are really necessary for our police department, especially when we talk about new technology. Uh, you know that we now have body cameras on many of our police officers. We want to continue that process as well. So I'm open for questions. Anything you want to share? Sure. I'll just add the, uh, th this whole consent decree process is uh, something that's being done for us uh, as opposed to something done to us. And the, as the mayor rapidly uh, embraces the process and leads us through uh, th this process, uh, I I'm convinced that it's already making us better and will just continue to make us better. So Thank thanks you. for your leadership, Mayor. Director, would you like to say anything in reference to your, especially your civilian Just, review board? I can barely contain my enthusiasm and excitement. I think oh, go that ahead. You can jump this, <laughs> this task force, um, and you know, I thank the mayor for moving this process along so quickly, even before the deadline of the consent decree. But I think this task force is finally going to give us, um, it's a step in the, uh, uh, in the ladder toward making the civilian review board and making civilian oversight um, actually legitimate and, and realize its intended purpose. All right, I'm open for questions. But, but what's your ideal in terms of community oversight? That's a nice sounding term, but what does that really mean? We've had, you know, other community groups and the Civilian Review Board right now, which I'm going to ask you about separately, has seven vacancies on it. So what is the goal of community oversight? Well, they, they will actually, under this process, because we will have a monitor, an independent monitor, they will actually get to review materials that they should, that they request. Uh, they will actually have some input on this process. And I think with um, uh, the person that we've chosen to lead this process, uh, former delegate, well, you know, once a delegate, always a delegate, uh, Jill Carter, who has been a, a community advocate on behalf of the citizens of our city and a person who has really been actively engaged in trying to push us forward uh, as it relates to what a civilian review, review board should be. Um, we will have citizens, uh, at least as we review this process, we want citizens to be engaged. Uh, we want them to feel free to express themselves, to request information that they think is necessary uh, to review any situation. And so I, I consider this to be a very important aspect of how we create uh, uh, police reform in our city. Well, Mayor, if you look at the history of the Civilian Review Board, you know, the police department was not always forthcoming with information to that board. I mean, when you look at documents, it shows rarely did they comply with requests for information, and the FOP has bought it. What's going to be different about this board in terms of its ability to have oversight and actually take the information to be? We're giving them the power to do that. And, and let me just say, um, I can't answer for the Civilian Review Boards of the past. I can answer for the Civilian Review Board as we put it in place. We've done our work in terms of people that we've selected to be on the Civilian Review Board. I think Jill has done a, a great job of looking for individuals in the community. And so I'm excited, you know, and as I said, we will monitor this process. We also have an independent monitor. We have an office uh, that looks over it. And so um, I believe that they're going to be able to ascertain whatever their needs may be. And at the same time, I think that they will help us lead, they will lead us towards criminal justice reform. But seriously, I mean, the, the, uh, much, much of the task of the oversight task force is to look at whether the Civilian Review Board is um, functioning well or should be changed. Should right. Up. But right now, there really isn't a Civilian Review Board. So well, they are going to be finding that, yeah, they're not doing their job because they're not. Well, they won't be able to find that now because you, you just pointed out, we just now appointed the people who will be on uh, that board. You have appointed them? Yes. Okay. But we do, you know, we do checks and balances to make sure that the people that we put on are people who will do the work and do the, and put the time in. And I think in the next uh, six months or so, you all get to ask them the question, are they ascertaining the information that they want? Uh, do they feel that their positions are uh, have 
of the wide range of needs, uh, have the wide range areas that they feel they should be able to access, um, I think you all get to ask them that probably in the next six months or so. So what's the organizational chart look like? I mean, no, I'm not, who's, oh. who's, who's the top? Who answers to whom going down the line? Well, they answer to Jill, the Civilian Review Board. So the Civilian Review Board answers to Jill. The Community Oversight Task Force, or the police, whatever it's called, the, the new task force, the five-member mm -hmm. task force that you appoint answers to? It, it will answer to us, to, to the mayor's office. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's... And in the pecking order of, I'm just trying to figure out. I, you know, look, really look, all, let me just say, let me just say, all of this is all of this is new for us as well. And what we've done is we've looked at what other cities, uh, how other cities have answered consent decrees. And when you had this much engagement that we've had from the community, we think that it's important to engage the community oversight task force because they too get to raise questions and they too get to make sure that this whole process is working on their behalf. You know, the independent monitor gets to look at all of it and say, well, you know, the civilian review board, uh, they're not being able to ascertain the information that, you know, they are, that they're requesting. The community oversight task force has made some recommendations that we think ought to be implemented in this process. And so, I mean, this is all, this is all new for us. But we've looked around the country to see what kind of uh, consent decree uh, information should be in our process and what organizations or what groups should be a part of our process. And, you know, we get to take a look at this, as does the independent monitor. And he may say, well, you know what, you might need to do ABC as it relates to your civilian review board, your COTF. Uh, has made some recommendations, and we too agree. I mean, I think what we're creating are backup systems that support this whole criminal justice reform and police reform. Yeah. When do you think people will notice the change in the way the police department operates and when there are reforms? I mean, there's been a lot of people skeptical of efforts like this in the past. Now you have a consent. Uh, well, we, we, we've not had this in the past. I mean, I can't. I, well, I know. No, 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 we've not had this in the past. Other I don't have a genie. Mm -hmm. Little thing to look through. Uh, I think that's what you call it. What is it? I don't have a I don't have a crystal ball. But here's what I do know. I know that for the last two or three years, and having chaired the Criminal Justice Reform Commission in the state of Maryland, that people have asked for reforms of police departments across the state, and we specifically have asked for reforms for Baltimore City. We engaged in some of the activities to reform our police department before there was a consent decree. And so all we're saying is that we believe that what we've put in place is what we believe will help to change what people have talked about in, in their testimonies, uh, the unfair treatment that they believe that they've gotten, uh, the lack of access to information. Um, so we believe that we've put together uh, the tools that will help us to reform our police department, but more importantly, uh, to see a difference in, uh, as you would say, in the next six months or next year or so, uh, I think that we will be able to see a difference. I think uh, this whole outreach to the community, uh, we want to see that. I think you will see uh, police officers uh, interacting with the community in, in different ways. I think that through the training that will take place, when you encounter somebody that's mentally ill or has a drug problem, the approach will be different uh, than it had maybe it was five years ago. So, I mean, I think there are a lot of things. I mean, I can sit here and speculate on what uh, this would look like a year from now, but I think the work uh, that we do will speak for itself. Just a quick follow up given that the Justice Department's been skeptical of these efforts, uh, Attorney General Sessions' efforts, are you going to have, do you think we'll have the money and the resources to implement this? Absolutely. Absolutely, because one of the things, um, even in the skepticism of what they've said, what they've also said is we're ready to work with Baltimore uh, to help their police department. And so part of that is helping us to get the technology and all of those things that we need uh, to continue this reform. Uh, Delegate Carter and Commissioner, um, maybe you can both address this from different sides of the um, debate. Uh, and I'll start with you, Delegate Carter. Are you confident that if this task force 
determines that the Civilian Re Review Board is not getting the information that it should and is not able to do the job it is supposed to be doing, that the monitor will be able to put in place changes that are not preempted or blocked by provisions within state law or in the union contract? Yes. A short answer. So, uh, <laughs> yes, and a, a, a little longer. The, we have a weekly disciplinary accountability meeting uh, at police headquarters e every week. And on the agenda every week, and I insist that this remains on the agenda, is the CRB. So every week I'm hearing about contact with uh, the delegate's office, um, what's, what's, um, what's going on in terms of requests, and where are we in terms of the relationship as it continues to improve. Commissioner, you know, you said you wanted to sort of transition out of plain clothes as part of reform efforts. How is that going in terms of having fewer officers in jeans and t-shirts, et cetera, walking well, around the city? Well, we, we still have plain clothes officers. They, they serve uh, as undercover officers, but they don't take uh, enforcement on the streets. So the transition has been, if you're going to enforce laws, if you're going to stop people, if you're going to engage in traffic stops, if you're going to uh, execute search warrants, you're going to be dressed uh, as I am, a very identifiable professional as a police officer, because that's what the community expects to, to see us as, as police officers. So that's going really well. Um, so plain clothes has a place in our profession, but over the years it has uh, been exacerbated, and, and not only in Baltimore, but across the country, um, over the years, more and more police officers who engaged in enforcement actions uh, were no longer wearing this uniform in its entirety. And, and Baltimore is going to lead the way uh, with that reform, and I think that is a reform. And, and I'm, I'm really proud that the agency is embracing it. Commissioner, this is, um, we just passed the two-year anniversary of Freddie Gray's arrest and death. What's the status of the internal investigations of the six officers that were involved? So, Jane, as, uh, as you know and your colleagues are aware, uh, we asked the Montgomery County Police Department uh, to conduct that administrative investigation uh, because I didn't want there to be uh, any appearance of impropriety, and uh, that investigation is, is ongoing. Uh, we are well aware of the, the time limits that are associated uh, and as defined by the Law Enforcement Officers' Bill of Rights, so we're aware of those time limits, and we are in uh, constant contact with the Montgomery County Police Department. I recently met with uh, Chief Manger just to ensure that all the timelines are adhered to, and I'm confident that they will be, and I await the results of that administrative investigation. What does he say is taking so long? Well, Jane, it's, uh, it's an administrative investigation that involves six police officers who are being treated as respondents in, a, uh, in an investigation that deserves uh, their best investigative effort. So um, as long as that investigation is conducted within the time frame uh, as allowed uh, by the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, I'm confident that I'm going to get the results of that investigation uh, in a manner that allows me to then make a final determination uh, from there. Pertaining to the RFA or the monitor, um, I've talked to some folks familiar with past consent decrees and the current DOJ's uh, position, and they suggested that that process may be one in which the DOJ uh, may try to assert a different stance on how it approaches the consent decree by perhaps pushing a, a monitor who would be more in, in line with law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Have you had conversations with them about where they stand and what they would like to see about the, from a monitor? The RFA gives the final authority to the city so and working with our team. So the DOJ does not, you know, while they may have input, they don't have the final authority in the selection of the <coughs> independent monitor. When, when would the monitor be in place? I mean, you've got the applications coming, but when, when do you expect that monitor to be in place? Do we have a date for that? The deadline is will approach towards the end of next month. People will be applying um, right. and responding to the application. And then within the next, towards the end of the Yeah, summer, we would think, the next month yeah, we would think probably by um, June, I mean, July, uh, that we should be able to have the independent monitor in place. But again, let me just remind Sorry. those who are applying uh, to be on the uh, C, 
COTF, Community Oversight Task Force. An application is available on the website and is due by May 22nd. Can we just, uh, are there currently zero vacancies on the Civilian Review Board? Are there any vacancies now? There, no, that with um, all of the recent nominations, all the voting seats have been filled. Okay. They're just not listed. Can you tell the nomination not yet. going through the confirmation process, so there's a city council confirmation process, and I think those individuals will be on the city council agenda next I week. I think next right? week. I think next week or the two so weeks from now. That's through the city council process. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Hey, Ms. Mayor, have you heard from the Department of Justice at all? I mean, are they in communication with you? They, I know, you know, you were asked the question about whether or not, because they expressed. Um, yeah, we've worked together on this entire process. I mean, DOJ's been involved as well. So recently they've been in contact with you? And yes. Okay. 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 And have they said anything expressing the doubts that they expressed in the, in the, in the No, hearing? not at all. Okay. Mm -mm. All right, folks. Uh, just a quick question: The uh, Police Training Commission's uh, reversal of the marijuana policy. Any reaction? I know you. This is something you would push for for a long time, and would help in vacancies on the police department. I, saw oh, that. That <laughs> <laughs> I have. Uh, it, it's actually not a reversal. It's a common sense amendment to it uh, that I proposed last year. And like like everything in government, there's a process. And uh, really proud of of my colleagues. Uh, overwhelming majority uh, voted to amend uh, the, this, this hiring standard that frankly has been in, in place since the 1970s. And as we aim to be more inclusive as a profession, uh, we, we don't want to serve a, a applicant who's otherwise completely qualified to be a police officer a death sentence from becoming a police officer because of a standard that was adopted when our society was at a much, much different place. So we're, we're excited about that. Just think we might not have had a president. Well, a couple of them, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you.